And on the line with me is Farron Cousins, co-host of Ring of Fire, contributor to Desmog Blog, the editor of the Trial Lawyer Magazine. TROfire.com is the website. You can tweet him at Farron Balanced. That's F-A-R-R-O-N Balanced, or at Ring of Fire Radio. And Farron, welcome back to the program. Tom, thanks for having me. Great to have you with us. So where and when will the next oil bomb train explode? I guess we just uh, we just had one, right? Yeah, we did, um, you know, uh, uh, seven days ago. And unfortunately, we don't know where or when the next one's going to happen. But we do know, given the current state of our rail system, our, our, our trains that we're operating, and the way that they package this Bakken oil into the trains, we know that it will happen again, uh, specifically because the, the rail industry and the oil industries have until the year 2025 to make the necessary upgrades to help prevent disasters like what we saw in Oregon from happening again. They have nine more years before they have to get up to code, which includes making sure that the uh, uh, braking systems on the trains are modernized. I mean, that, look, here's something that people don't understand. The, these trains that are running this highly volatile Bakken oil from the Canada to the United States coast to coast are using braking systems that were developed in the 1860s. The Whoa. exact same technology from, you know, uh, uh, antebellum to today. And we do have modernized electronic braking systems available. But the reason that they're not mandated is because the oil lobby and the rail lobbies are two of the most powerful in the United States. They have met personally with people from the White House, members of Congress, members of, of the Senate to prevent any form of meaningful regulation from taking place because they don't want to spend the money. It's a lot cheaper to hire a lobbyist than it is to upgrade your system to keep the environment and the American public safe from your bomb trains. And that's a pretty grim commentary on the state of American politics. I mean, this is the thing that uh, Senator Sanders has been campaigning against aggressively is, is, you know, corporate money in politics or billionaire money in politics for that matter. And uh, here, we're, here we're seeing an example, uh, these, these oil bomb trains. Now, if, if, if Farron, first of all, feel free to riff on that. But also, um, what do you say to folks? I've, I've had this thrown in my face. And, and the first time it happened, it kind of surprised me. And then, and then I thought about it. Um, oh, you don't like these oil trains? Cool. Let us run pipelines. <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing is we, we had all these, you know, the, the essentially the Keystone XL uprising that helped prevent the pipeline from becoming a reality today. But while we were fighting that big fight, we lost so many other fights throughout this country on minor pipelines that together, you know, we're talking about hundreds, uh, possibly thousands of miles of new pipeline that was put in place. So we do have pipelines. The problem is not that, oh, well, let's switch it to pipelines. The problem here is the, the stabilization process of the Bakken oil that's being put into these trains. They're, it's essentially, uh, they're carrying higher than average amounts of natural gas liquids in the oil. And there is a process that removes this uh, natural gas from the oil and makes it less likely to explode in the event of a crash. However, once again, it costs money to do that. Now, when the oil gets to its destination, that is done. It's done and it's mandated before it goes on an oil tanker, before it uh, uh, goes in a oil car that's gonna travel down the highways, but we don't mandate it for rails. The problem is not switching, and I've heard people say that too, it's not switching from one uh, uh, tracking source to another. The big issue is let's switch off of oil altogether. I, I don't know about you, but I haven't seen a, a, a truckload of sunlight spill, a truckload yeah. of wind. Those don't cause the, the disasters that we're talking about here. Those don't pollute. So why, when we have all of this technology available to get us off of these fossil fuels, are we still shipping oil using trains uh, that are essentially using the same equipment they used 150 years ago? Yeah. That's it's, the way of thinking in America today. We're still thinking like we were 150 years ago. It's craziness. It's, well, in 150 years ago, we were at the peak of the, uh, maybe 140 years ago, at the, at the peak of the Gilded Age, and uh, you know, the, which was arguably one of the two major peaks of corporate control or uh, you know, billionaire control of our government. Um, but you know, I, that may be a whole other 
another discussion. But what you're talking about with this with this Bakken crude is these high, uh, the natural gas, the high fractions. These are not only the most volatile, that, mo that is to say, the most easily evaporated, but also the most explosive because they're so volatile, because they easily evaporate. It's like the difference between gasoline and diesel fuel. And, and, and also, those high fractions, the benzene, the toluene, the, the, the acetone, the ketones, all these different uh, chemicals that are, in, that, are, that are the most volatile chemicals in, in oil are also the most carcinogenic, are they not? They are. And that's why you see when we have these disasters, which what happened last week, uh, you know, Justin McCulka, my colleague at Desmog Blog, has been covering these bomb trains for years and did a phenomenal workup on this. But he, he points out that this was a best case scenario because we had no fatalities from the actual explosion. We, you know, the, the train wasn't speeding. Uh, you know, it was one of the most up to date of the old uh, standard cars. But still, we had this disaster. And when there is one of these explosions, it's not just the explosion and it's over. All of those chemicals that you just mentioned, the benzene, everything, goes up into the air and is dispersed. That's why when there's an evacuation, it's just not those in the immediate blast zone, which is 25 million Americans. It is those within, you know, uh, the, the air range because those chemicals, they go up and they come back down and settle. And that's why the first responders are, are, are dressed in these masks and have all of this and they get the people out of the way because it only takes a few minutes being exposed to that after the immediate uh, uh, blast to inhale a deadly amount that can kill you. Right. And or can, that, cause, that's, can cause liver cancer or brain cancer or right. leukemia or the other cancers that we know are associated with these high fractions five, 10, <laughs> 20 years down the road. I mean, this is, this is, this is amazing stuff this is, that this is being done. Well, it really is. And, and again, it goes back to the powerful rail and oil lobbies. Sarah, and you, they said, haven't, you, you said 25 million people are exposed to this. Talk about that, if you don't mind. Well, well, there's 25 million people that live within what they consider to be blast zones of oil by rail accidents. Um, mm. So 25 million people live within uh, a rail line that of accidents that have already happened or potential accidents. Potential accidents, potential accidents and obviously ones that have happened. So, yeah. I mean, that, that is a huge chunk of the American population. And most of them uh, have no idea that they're living, you know, within such a, a close distance from a potential natural disaster because the rail industry has lobbied for rules that allow them to transport materials with non-disclosure laws. They do not have to let anyone know what is on that particular train. So a bomb um, train might be coming through the middle of your town and nobody even says, hey, you know, it might be a good idea to bring the kids indoors or it might be a good idea to go to the park this afternoon. Exactly. And it's one of the few industries in this country that is able to operate with such, you know, uh, with so little transparency. And again, it's because the rail lobby isn't one that anybody ever focuses on. It's not like the oil industry where we watch what they do daily or the big pharma. The rail industry is something most people don't think about because trains, again, it's kind of an antiquated way of thinking, but they're still out there every single day. And we need to start paying attention to what's coming out of Congress about this, what's coming out of the White House, because they've been active in preventing the destabilization of this oil before it's loaded onto the train. There are a lot of moving parts here. And the more you start looking into the story, the more disgusting it gets, because it seems like both parties are, are, are almost equal in their desire to not have any regulations on these trains. Both the oil industry and the rail industry. That's, that, it's amazing. Karen Cousins, brilliant work, sir. Uh, Co-host of Ring of Fire, contributor to Desmond, blog, editor of Trial Lawyer Magazine, TROfire.com. Farron, F-A-R-R-O-N, balanced, at Farron Balance. You can tweet him. Thank you, Farron. Thank you, Tom. To watch more clips from our programs, hit the Watch More Videos button over here. And please be sure to hit the handy-dandy subscribe button so you'll always be up to date. Tag, you're it.